So mathematical and computational models allow us to create some uh, scenarios that we cannot recreate in reality in a situation. And so create some synthetic scenario where we can take into account the population of hosts, so individuals for example, take into account their interactions, their behavior, modeling the spread of the disease in this population, and at the same time allow us to understand what is happening, for example, in a current epidemic. And within this synthetic scenario, we can also test the possible interventions, which could range from pharmaceutical interventions, like, for example, using uh, medicines, uh, or could be also non-pharmaceutical intervention, like, for example, adoption of different behaviors that can limit the spread of a disease. So individual behavior is very important, clearly. If you're thinking about an epidemic that spreads from person to person, Person, how people interact uh, is extremely important. It's one ingredient that we have to take into account. Now we have, typically we have baseline models where we characterize this behavior on basic condition, baseline condition. But as soon as there is an epidemic, if there are some factors, for example, like inducing panic, or even if there are some recommendations, for example, by public health authorities, this behavior may change. These are all elements which are provided somehow in a, in a top-down fashion from public health authorities to the public. But there is also a strong component which could be uh, independently uh, chosen by, by the, the general public, by individuals themselves. And we have seen that many, many times. One first uh, event, typically, for thinking about epidemics at a global space is that people reduced traveling to the affected area. This was uh, clearly observed during SARS epidemic in 2003, uh, was also present during H1 and 1 pandemic at the beginning, um, and uh, we ob uh, observed the same also for Ebola epidemic. So this is a spontaneous reaction of individuals to an ongoing outbreak. And somehow these are the most difficult aspects uh, to, to model because it's hard to have data in real time. More than 50% of infectious diseases affecting humans are at zoonosis, so they're coming from animals. On one side, we would like to look at uh, understanding uh, spread from animals to humans, and now there is a huge effort, for example, in the research community in trying to model these two aspects in an integrated way. So one recent example, for example, is the MERS epidemic, where we currently observe is a very complicated transmission, as we currently observe both the zoonotic transmission, so from animals to humans, and then also human to human transmission. So we have the two components. One of the main problem is really trying to understand what is exactly the path of transmission from environmental or animal source to humans. Why is this important? Because we, if you're able to identify that, then we are able also to put some control, intervention, strategies and measures in order to avoid that this transmission may occur. And so what we do is really just to focus exclusively on animals. Uh, of course, it's harder than studying humans. Uh, we may collect a lot of data, uh, but these are wild animals, so uh, different techniques uh, need to be employed. And what we do is to trace uh, their movements in space, uh, trying to model their interaction depending on environmental conditions, and so trying to understand what are the conditions that make the disease uh, persistent in that population and that could lead afterwards to spillover to humans.